Ladies and gentlemen, our program is about to begin. We would like to ask you to please take your seats and ensure that all electronic devices have been turned to off or silent. Thank you for your cooperation. Our program is about to begin. Watcher, take one. Phones on silent, please. Why I create is a kind of a great question. Why do I create? I create because I just really love games, you know? And it's a lot of fun to make them. I have so many ideas. I have so many things I want to explore. I can't imagine doing anything else. Uh, it's, it's what's on my mind when I wake up in the morning. It's, it's, it's on my mind when I'm falling asleep. It's an odd question, and um, from my perspective, I don't know why other people don't create. I think it was uh, more a series of little moments rather than one big defining origin story. I started playing Tomb Raider and sort of, for some reason, saw myself in Lara Croft. I was playing the Atari and television. When I was in my 20s, I thought all games were made in Japan. <sighs> Mind bone, you know? <laughs> all of a sudden, this kind of curtain came back and I was like, I want to program stuff. Wow, this helped me or inspired me to create my own project. I don't think I ever really knew what I wanted to do with my life, but I knew that I wanted to be an artist. Playtest is truth. Unveiling and announcing games is one part very, very exciting and one part absolutely terrifying. <sighs> hurts, man. <laughs> it hurts. You are in a, a dark well most of the time, and occasionally, like, light comes in. Yeah, we're in a good state now. There's not much left, and you keep saying that for a year. The last 10% is really another 90%. Every time I got really close to finishing a game, I'd be like, 
oh man, there was another game come out and I was like, oh, why didn't we work on something like that instead? And then a nine year old walked up to my game and he played it for 45 minutes straight. He was like, no, 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 I got it, like one more time. And he's like, like can I, do you mind, can I, can I play it one more time? And I was like, sweetheart, you can play whatever you want. And so to watch people experience it for the very first time is like taking someone to the ocean for the first time. You know, that is basically the old adage that art and creativity services the gameplay in our case. And it's a case of you know, meeting the audience's expectations and you know, surpassing them, you know, showing them the things they didn't know they wanted until they've got it from you. Please welcome Clive Downey. Hey everyone. Hi. How are you doing? Great to see you. Hi. We're in Austin. Welcome. No, I think you can do better than that. We're in Austin. That's right. Well, well, welcome. Welcome to Unite Austin 2017. Welcome in this room. There's certainly a lot more of you than there was when we were rehearsing. Uh, welcome in the overflow room. Uh, welcome on the live stream. Welcome. Um, there's beginner developers in here. There's advanced developers in here, there's indies, there's representatives from major gaming companies, there's engineers, developers, artists, animators. There's so many more. This, just, this is the world of creativity right here. Um, I tell you who else is here is representatives of uh, the Austin game making community. You know, this place, that's right, woof, woof. <laughs> this, this town. This town is a, is a hotbed of creativity. And so we've got representatives from that hotbed right here. Our own Unity Austin team are here as well. These are the people who bring you Unity Cloud Build. <laughs> Unity teams collaborate. So, you know, thank you for hosting us. Thank you for hosting us, Austin. Thank you for hosting us. So, um, you know, we continue to be amazed by just the sheer size and scale of the creativity that you are bringing to the world. In the last 12 months alone, the things that great game developers have made with Unity have been downloaded 20 billion times. 20 billion times. That's 654 a second. 654 times a second, people have downloaded what this community makes. It's truly spectacular. And 40% of the top 1,000 games are powered by Unity. We're particularly humbled by that. Of all the new games launched on mobile, half of them are powered by Unity. And this burgeoning new world of VR and AR that is being pioneered right now, of everything there, 60% of the things yeah, you're using um, to, to, to drive that world are made with Unity. So, but that's the numbers. The numbers are OK. Uh, I prefer and you prefer just to see the games. So let's have a look at those games right now. Really special. I, uh, I, I've had the, 
I've had the good fortune to be in this wonderful games business, business for well over 20 years, and videos like that I still find inspirational to this day. Show me a game reel any day and I get inspired by it. The, you know, the other thing that we are inspired by at Unity on a daily basis is our principles. We always talk about our principles because they are important to us. They're important to how we think about what we can deliver to you. The, the first principle is democratization of development. Um, put simply, this is, it's as simple as this. We believe that the world is a better place with more creators. We believe that when we can put the most powerful creative tools in the hands of as many people like you, that you can transform your ideas to reality and you can make the world a better place. We believe that. Secondly, our second principle is solving hard problems. Making things, making games, making anything is hard work. It's really tough. And that journey from concept to launch is just a really tough one. It doesn't matter what you're making. So we strive to stand shoulder to shoulder with you to make that journey as easy as possible. You're going to see some ways today that we are continuing to solve hard problems in the new version of Unity. And thirdly, our third principle is to enable your success. Now, success comes in all shapes and sizes. It might be how many projects that you can make a year. It might be how many people interact with what you make and consume what you make. It might be money so you can make a living, as simple as that. Or it might be as simply powerful as you have an idea and you want to make something for yourself and stand back and think, yeah, I did that. I made that. Whatever success looks like for you, our aspiration is that we can give it to you. So, our three principles shape what we make. They shape what we make and what we bring you. And we've been using them to power our next major release, Unity 2017.2. 2017.2 is coming out later this month. And thanks very much to those of you who have been in the beta program. You've been hammering away and polishing it for all of your peers. Thank you for that. In delivering this new release, we've continued to stay focused on what matters to you. You've told us what matters to you, and it's these things. Quality and stability, that matters to you. We've continued to push the quality and stability of the core engine of Unity, solidifying the foundation that you rely on on a daily basis to get done what you need to get done. We've driven down our bug counts. We've invested in QA resource. We've also invested in core engineering. Core engineering at Unity is going to be 500 people strong by the end of this year. That's, that's 500 engineers working for you when you choose the Unity engine for your creativity. Um, this team was instrumental in bringing you Unity 2017.2, by the way. Secondly is performance. Everyone wants more power per pixel and we're undertaking major overhauls to the core of Unity to take us to a transformational next level for the engine, which is going to be able to take your creativity to the next level too. Joachim, the co-founder of Unity, is going to be out later today to show you that real stuff. It is not theory. It's supremely exciting. Now, with graphics, with Unity 5 way back, you know, PBR, physically-based rendering, we brought that, and we've been learning from that. And with your feedback, we focused our attention on more flexible light mapping, industry-leading post-processing, and rebuilding our renderers, which we are doing, we're really excited about. And with 2017 and beyond, we're going all out to bring you the best platform-specific performant rendering engine. It doesn't matter what you want to do on whatever platform. Now, we've made big improvements with our last version for artists and designers with features like Timeline, Cinemachine, and our post-processing stack. And we are not done yet. We've got more improvements to the creation workflow for better in-game iteration and decision-making, basically enabling the whole team to work efficiently together. There's no reason why different people on a team, engineers, developers, and artists, should be operating at different speeds. Everyone should be moving together at the same speed. And then lastly, you can count on us to provide industry-leading multi-platform support and integration. We partner with 25 great platforms, from Apple to Xbox, to ensure timeless and seamless integrations. Put really simply, so you can build once and reach the largest selection of consumers that you need to for your creativity. Now, 
2017 represents the most powerful real-time creative engine and complete creation tool set to date. We're really excited to bring it to you. It is jammed full of too many features to take you through without this keynote being about eight hours long, so we're not gonna do that. What we've done is we've pulled key features out. We're gonna bring them to life for you starting right now. Let's go, thank you. My friend Vess, who works at Unity, a few weeks ago he went to this game jam and he made some rules for himself. He said, I'm not gonna do any custom modeling and I'm not gonna do any custom texturing and I just wanna see how far I can get. So he went to the asset store and got a whole bunch of assets from the asset store just to see if he could turn that into something pretty. And he does this because he really cares a lot about the process of creative prototyping, about making sure that very early in your project, you have the project in a state where you can already see and feel what the project wants to be. Where you can say things like, well, I don't think that direction is really gonna work very well, let's try it a bit more like that. Because only in that phase of the project, you'll get a much better idea of which assets really don't matter so much and which assets are really gonna set your project apart and you wanna spend your energy on. Please welcome Lucas Meyer. <laughs> hey everybody, let's have some fun. <laughs> I'm gonna show you a scene today I'm going to show you how a scene was made. And when I first saw this scene, I didn't really believe it was put together in a few days. Let's take a look. I have it open here on my, uh, in my Unity editor, in my scene view. And the first thing that you will see is that I have a whole bunch of buildings sort of propped out in my scene view. These are all from the sci-fi buildings pack on the Asus store. They're just sort of, you know, sprinkled around in the scene a little bit. If I zoom in a bit more, you can see that quite a bit of the scene is actually mapped out with Unity cubes. This is cube 24, the cubes we all uh, know and love. <laughs> <laughs> if I zoom in a bit more, if I can do that with my shaking hands, we enter this street here where a lot of things are going on. Let's take a look. Now, this is pretty much what I would expect the scene to look like if you were to grab all sorts of stock assets from a store or from, uh, from wherever and put them together in a scene. Assets that weren't necessarily made to look good together. Some of them maybe not even made to look good at all. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, they're pretty good. For instance, uh, you know, if we look around the scene here, this thing over here, what like, <laughs> like what is this even? This is like props for naval beacon. It's a naval beacon here, just sitting in the middle of the street. Makes no sense. At least they put like a little fence around it. Look at that. <laughs> this scene, it will lean very heavily on the post-processing stack and volumetric fog to go from this image to an image that I think looks pretty nice. Um, let's start off by taking a nice camera angle here to enable some of these post-processing stack effects. The first thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to enable lighting in my scene view. That's already gonna be quite a big difference. Look at that. So that gives us normal direct lighting and a little bit of a light map. The first effect I'm gonna turn on is ambient occlusion. It gives these really sort of soft contact shadows. Let me turn it on and off a few times for you so you can see. Oh, actually, let me turn on this thing here so we can actually see. There we go. It gives these really sort of soft, depthy feel to the scene. The next effect that I'm gonna turn on is screen space reflections. If you look closely at these puddles at the bottom of the, of the floor, I guess the floor only has a bottom, but you'll <laughs> have to forgive me for that. I'll turn it on and off, and you can really see that in these puddles, these yellow canisters, or what, like, whatever they are, get reflected, and it looks kind of nice. I'm also going to turn on my camera distortion, and I'm gonna turn on depth of field and motion blur, which you don't really see right now, but later on when the camera will start moving, they'll become more apparent. The biggest effect that this scene 
relies on is volumetric fog from the volumetric lighting pack. Let me turn that on. Like, whoa. It's an, it has an enormous effect on the scene. In fact, it's so big that I'm immediately going to tone it down a little bit by applying my color grading and my auto exposure. Let's take a look at this volumetric fog. I have a multiplier here, and I can crank it all the way up so you can really see the effect it has on the scene. But I could also tone it all the way down. And when I tone it all the way down, you can see that there's almost nothing left in the scene. That's because this scene is lit by these area lights, but it's not so much the direct lights of these area lights that make the scene come together. It's the fact that these lights shine onto the fog, and then it's the fog that what, uh, that's what you see. So when I take out the fog, there's almost nothing left. Let me bring that guy back up. Let's take a look at these color grading thing that I just quickly enabled. I'm going to turn that on and off a few times for you as well. Look at that. Color grading in post-processing is such a big part these days of achieving this final look for your game or for your movie or for whatever, for whatever it is that you're making. Some people you know, spend their whole careers learning how to properly color grade. And Unity, it brings these movie industry color grading tools in the hands of game developers everywhere. I have these three color wheels over here. I mean, it has zillions of buttons that I don't really understand, but this left one here, <laughs> they control my shadows. So maybe if I want to have like a little bit more bluish shadows, I can drag that to the bottom like that. And the right one over here is my highlights. So if I want to have a little bit more warm highlights, Maybe I just drag that a little bit more to the red or yellow, like that. Check that out. It's amazing. It's just so much fun to just play around with. And it's an essential part these days of really getting the final look of your game right. Let me move that back so that Vess, who made this scene, doesn't yell at me. <laughs> All right, I'm going to add one more effect. I'm going to add the bloom that really makes these neon signs pop out. And then I'm going to add a few small ones, a little bit of aberration, a little bit of vignette, some grain. And since it's uh, raining cats and dogs here in Austin, why not uh, <coughs> apply that to the scene as well? Notice, actually, that I'm doing all these image effects in the scene view. All these image effects, they run in the scene view these days. And that's super important, because the scene view is where you work. If you want to decide whether or not you want to move your naval beacon a bit more to the left or to the right, it's really nice to be able to do that and see what it ends up looking at without having to switch to the game view. It's also probably even more important just because it's the thing you look at all day. So, you know, we're in games, we make pretty things. Why, you know, if it's possible to look at something pretty all day versus something not pretty, like, why not do that? So they run in the scene view. And I think this is a pretty good time to see what this scene is going to look like if we add a little bit of animation. What we're doing here is we're using timeline to animate this camera. We're also using timeline to animate these characters. And also these little friendly neighborhood drones that are flying around. You can see this little toy car in the bottom that gets in focus and out of focus. That's because Timeline also animates the focus length of the depth of field. And it gets this really nice sort of cyberpunky, gloomy, I really like the steam over here kind of feel to the scene. There's a few more things in this scene that I'd like to uh, highlight. Let me pause this for a little bit and free this camera from the timeline, like this, so that I can fly around a little bit. There's a few shots that I want to show you. Whoa! <laughs> um, like here, you have all these pipes, you have steam coming out. Notice that when I focus on the spaceship here, don't worry, there's just a spaceship here, um, it, becomes, uh, it becomes in focus, and when I look away, the depth of field focuses somewhere else. You have all these pipe systems here that lead to these sort of sewer pipe things. And 
I was wondering, has anyone seen these before, these sewer pipes? Maybe in a different game? Or maybe like, um, maybe like 30 seconds ago when I was over here? Look at that. It's just this sci-fi building. <laughs> and this scene is full of tricks like that. We just took this sci-fi building, we squashed it, put it on its side, slapped it on the wall, made it sort of attached to these pipes, yeah, kind of worked. And the scene is full of stuff like that. Here's one I really like. Notice this, uh, you have these really pretty area lights. But notice this sort of like darkish sci-fi ceiling with all these wires hanging from the bottom. That's not really a ceiling. <laughs> Let's take a look. Um, how do we take a look like this? That is actually a spaceship. <laughs> and <laughs> I mean, I like demoing it because I think it's kind of funny. But the more serious point is that when you do this creative prototyping, it's OK to use a spaceship as your ceiling. It's OK to use a building as sewer pipes. You do these things early in your project because you don't really know what the project's going to be yet, be like yet. Maybe the, the thing the projects end up being, the, the, the spaceship thing works fine. Only later in your project do you really realize which assets really are important and you want to maybe do some custom modeling for, and which assets just work fine like this. Let me fly around the scene a little bit more, just because I like it so much. Notice that you have these area lights that are shining on the fog. Over here, we have this steam that's coming out. That's a regular Unity particle system. But it's not emitting particles that you can see. It's actually emitting particles that contribute to the fog density there. So the fog is thicker, and that's why the area light is picking it up over there. And as I mentioned, this scene is full of sort of like creative recycling of assets. Like over here, this thing, this, this what is it? Uh, this is also one of the buildings from that sci-fi pack. If I go to the back here. You can see at the back wall, that's all, all the same trick. All sorts of buildings slapped on the side. When I, when I showed this scene to Adam, he went nuts. He immediately wanted to use it as a starting point to do some of his camera work. So let's hear from our chief camera commander, Adam. Cameras are so important for your project for lots of reasons. Here's two. Think of how much television we've watched, how many movies we've watched, hundreds, thousands of hours through a lens. And we have this subconscious understanding of what cameras do, how they move and what things look like. Think of an animation of a bouncy rubber ball. And if that animation wasn't good, we feel it. We look at it and we say, there's something wrong. Everybody knows how that should animate. And it's the same with cameras. We've never seen a camera instantly start or stop. There's an acceleration and a deceleration there because cameras weigh 50 pounds. So if you do that in your project, people will feel it. Something will feel wrong. The second thing is the power cameras have uh, to impart mood and style and tone. You can have the exact same scene, same animation, same lighting, and you shoot it differently and it will give you a completely different result. The good news is, Cinemachine can help you with both of these things. We've been working on it for a really long time. I'd like to elaborate on one last thing. I'm sure some of you are thinking, yeah, but we're making a game. It's not a movie. You know, we've got this extra dimension of interactivity. We can break the rules and we can try new things and we can innovate. And yes, but knowing the language where we came from, knowing when to break the rules can be really powerful. Please welcome Adam Myhill. Hi, Lucas. Hey, Adam, what's up? You. Hi, everybody. Show them what you got. So, was it amazing how lighting brought all this stuff together? And, yeah, I know. Yeah, lighting. I, I, I first saw this scene and I'm like, okay, what else can we do? Like, how can we build on this? And how can we use cameras and music to explore different styles and to, like, build on this idea of rapid prototyping, but with, you know, pacing of, of, of lens work and of, and of audio? So in 2017-1, we had Timeline, and that's it right here. 
And uh, these are Cinemachine clips. And Cinemachine is our procedural camera system. Where, which are Cinemachine clips? These little guys right here. So what I did was, is I put a bunch of cameras down. I did this pretty quickly. This is a few hours. I picked an audio track, and I thought, okay, let's explore a mood. So let's watch it. We hit play. Now something to note here is there's very few keyframes. These are procedural cameras and they work like you're a director and you say how you'd like to compose something and that's compositionally in, in screen space and as things move, the camera will follow it. There's no keyframes on this move. I'm just blending two timeline clips and saying I want to target the guy's face and I'd like it to be here on the screen. And for this super cool little probe thing, not animating the camera, we're just saying, look at the probe and compose it this certain way. And for this end sequence, we do this like dreamy, pull back into this blurry, depth of fieldy, you know, kind of messy thing. And it was done super quickly. Let me show you. So you, this is just the same scene I was working on. That's you right. You found all these shots in, in, in my little scene. Isn't it cool just how camera and audio can totally change how something feels? So look at this bit. Here is that shot right here. There's even a little bit of procedural noise. So there's actually not animated camera noise. We have a procedural noise system. And I'm going to go ahead and cut to this shot, where it's a little further back, and we crank the depth of field up. So this is a cut. But with the power of timeline, timeline mixes anything that's in two clips. So if I make it overlap, see this overlap section? That's now going to blend the camera transforms, but it's also blending all the post effects. So you can come up with these like crazy ideas super fast. So that's one bit. Okay, so that's, we call that what? Moody, right? Okay. So I don't know if I like that, you know, we're going to keep this, you going to mute it. And then a timeline, you've got these little groups here. And this is a different idea. I always see you work like that with timeline. You just use it like as a scrapbook and have most of them sort of turned off all the time. Yeah, because you can, you can have like little half-baked ideas and just sort of leave them there and mute them. And then you can drag clips around from other tracks so you can assemble all these ideas from, you know, you can just have like a parts bin of ideas that you assemble on the fly. Right. It's a really fast way of working. OK, so this is the next one. And uh, the camera's a little more upbeat, the music's a little more upbeat, but the exact same scene, the exact same everything. Now again, there's no camera animation. And I'll show you how that works. Ah, that probe looks cool. I know, I love that probe. It's just from the store, right? Yeah. A little bit of animation on that. This one was blending from a, a color to a black and white film grade, but I just left the red out, and just kept the red channel out. You know, trying out different ideas. I can't believe you found all these shots in this. In so you're working with your creative director, your art lead, and it's like, let's just try this out. Let's just throw some ideas down really quickly. And like you said before, some of these assets we might be getting too close to, some might be too heavy because they're too far away, and that's okay for right now because we're going to come up with a vision for it and then you know, adjust things as we need. So I want to show you that, that opening shot. Look at that's this. That's a shot. good example, actually. Like, when I was working with the scene, the characters were far away. Yeah. And the model was you know, good enough, but you changed the whole thing to be all about the cameras. Yeah. That might be a point in the project where I would decide to do some custom no, custom work on that. Right, and to spend some more time on you know, uprising models if they're close to the camera, and to not worry about stuff if it's in the background. So look at this. This is a clip. This is a Cinemachine clip. And watch, I'm going to just put on the window guides. This is how it works. It's a procedural camera system. You tell it what to look at, and I'm saying look at the ship. And then you say where you want to compose it on the screen. And no matter how that ship moves, it's going to give us that composition. So here's a new shot. It's a little bit lower and you can frame this. 
and I've got a little bit of lag and a little bit of decoupling so it feels like a weighty camera, and that whole move, there's not a single key frame of animation. Like this little probe, maybe you want to like move it over on this side. You can blend between these compositions. It's such a fast way of working. And what's, what's powerful about it is if you know, an animator comes in over the weekend and changes the animation or a designer makes things go 10% faster, and you come in the next day, your cameras aren't looking at you know, blue sky, which I've had happen to me a few times. They're, they'll dynamically track what's happening. So isn't it great to see these tools come alive? Uh, I could, like, I, like, we were backstage like practicing for the keynote. We were just you know, messing, around, <laughs> messing around with four hours. I can, uh, it's super cool. Yeah, no, it's great. So Lucas, thanks for the help with the demo. Hey, my pleasure. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Great. <laughs> So th think about this. We had an artist, Unity 2017, the asset store, a weekend, and it created that. And I want to build on the topic of asset tools, artist tools, because there's something to talk about, which is Unity and Autodesk. And today, we'd like to announce a collaboration which will create the most streamlined artist tools between Unity and your favorite 3D package like Max and Maya. Yeah. No, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. And this collaboration makes Unity the first game engine, the first creation engine, to have source code access to the Autodesk FBX file format and its SDK. And what that means is we can create these super fast workflows where artists can use the tools that they love and they can get their stuff into Unity really quickly. And I'm going to show you. Let's take a look. OK, so this goes pretty fast. So we've got a scene. This is in Unity. There's a cube. We want to export it. This is our new exporter. It comes into Maya. We import the model. Now we're in Maya. So you can you know, add detail. In this case, we're just going to put a new model in. We can add a stingray shader to it. There we go. Drag that on. Obviously, we can you know, model, texture, make it look better, things you do in Maya. You drag it, you put it into the Unity export, you hit the one export button, you come back into Unity, Dink. there it is. That's fast. That's fast. <clears throat> There's a knockout punch with this. This is the knockout punch. In Unity, you can put things on it, like collision volumes, box colliders, Unity type things. And when you bring it back into Maya, they're preserved. So you can actually go back into Maya again. It's like a washing machine round trip. You can improve it, tweak some more things, go back into Unity, and all that stuff's still there. So I know for content creators or people who do this stuff day in, day out, that workflow is going to be, that's a lifesaver. OK. So any second now, that's going to come on the screen. <laughs> 2D, hotbed of creativity. When you think about it, 2D is like this is where gaming began. And it's amazing to see games innovating and pushing, games like Sundred and Hollow Knight and Cuphead. And we have a bunch of new 2D features, which we're going to unlock even more for you. And we're going to show you that now, too. For the past couple of years, We've been hard at work on the 2D foundational features at Unity. This is an important area of focus for us. Even though we want to work on the high-level features, we want to make sure that they are built on top of a strong foundation. Now, we're really excited that this year we've completed a lot of that work, and we're about to release the first of our 2D layout tools. This is Tilemap, which we're releasing with 2017.2. Now this is a tool for building grid-based layouts in Unity. I feel really strongly about this tool because it's going to empower artists and designers to express themselves and to literally paint directly in Unity. And we're really happy to see that some studios have started using Tilemap to create new and innovative experiences for their players. Please welcome Russ Scammell. Hi, Russ. Hi, Adam. How's it going? It's going well. Good. Good to see you. Awesome. Hi, everyone. 
<laughs> it's been an awesome year for 2D at Unity. With 2017.2, we're proud to introduce Tilemap. Now, this is a tool for designing games that need a grid-based layout. Now, earlier this year, we released many other 2D features as well, other two, uh, important 2D features, like the Sprite Atlas asset and the Sprite Mask component. We also released sorting groups and axis distance sort. This is really important for those of you who are trying to deal with the tricky problem of sorting in 2D games. Also new with 2017.2, Cinemachine for 2D. With a number of new features, this makes a really powerful 2D camera system right in Unity. Now, we're going to take a look at these features in action using assets from a game by Epic House Studios. Now, Phased was one of the first games that was built on our new Talmap feature. This unique Made with Unity title makes creative use of pixel art and glitch effects to tell the story of a girl who wakes up to find that she has the power to twist reality. Take a look at the art direction, the way they've embraced the really like pixelated, vintage sort of throwback uh, art style, but then they've added modern aspects to it, like uh, chromatic aberration and some distortion buffers to re reinforce uh, bits of the gameplay. We'd like to thank the awesome Epic House team for letting us use their assets. And now I'm going to build a level from Phased in Tilemap. OK. So Tilemap has this really smooth workflow that allows me to import my images that I've been designing in my art authoring tool directly into Unity. And I can just drag them into, they come in as sprites, and I just drag them into the tile palette, and I get tiles. And these tiles are now ready to be painted on a tile map in the scene. So I'm going to take a look at one of these uh, tile maps. The first one I'm going to paint is I'm going to start by painting the walls of the level. And I'm going to use what we call a custom tile for this. Now, a custom tile, let's click on it here. A custom tile here is a rule tile. This is the example. And it allows designers to create relationships between neighboring tiles so that you can paint the appropriate tile based on these relationships. In other words, if you want to make automatic corners and edges and things like this. OK? OK, so I'm going to start by painting this tile map onto the scene. So I'm just picking it here with a uh, paintbrush. And we're just painting directly in the scene. So that's pretty cool. You can see there's automatic corners coming in. But I want to work a bit faster, so I'm going to use a box fill. There we are. Uh, let's go a little bit faster here and then make the rest of the level. There we go. OK. Now, you can make your own custom tiles. This is one of them. And you do this by extending the tile class. But of course, we want to get you up and running quickly. So we've provided a set of custom tiles and brushes as part of our 2D extras package. Now, I want to make this wall more colorful. Um, I'm thinking maybe some posters. Now, this scene has been set up with multiple tile maps, so I can create a layering effect. So I'm going to start with one layer of posters here. I'm going to grab these and start painting them here in the scene. And then I'm going to grab another group of posters, and I'm going to put those in front of these. Just zoom in a bit here. And then I want some furniture, so I've got another tile map for that. And I'm going to come here and get a bed, put that down, and then put down some bedside tables. Here we go. And then maybe a room divider over here to make this uh, scene complete. I'll probably need a door. Otherwise, the main character is going to be stuck in this level forever. So there we go. We've got an exit. OK, great. Now, you can add normal interactive game objects into your scene as well. They're just going to play well with the uh, multiple layers of tile maps. They're just going to blend seamlessly. Um, here, we're going to look at a, a couple of those. So here, I've got some props. Uh, if I zoom in here, we can see a, a fan and an alarm clock. And these are just game objects right, with colliders. And you can sort these with the layers in the tile map using sorting groups and sorting layers and, of course, your order in layer. OK. Now, I'd like to add a collider to the walls tile map, because otherwise, when I put my player in the scene, she's just going to fall straight through the floor. right? 
And alongside this, alongside the tile map, we have the tile map collider. So I'm going to select a walls tile map here, and I'm going to turn on the tile map collider 2D. OK, and just like that, we have collision that is derived from the physics shape of the sprites that we use in that tile map. And this plays well with the composite collider. If I turn that on, you can see now we have a more optimized collision shape, and that's going to work better in okay, your games. Russ, you yes. know artists are always changing their minds. Yeah. And this level will go through iterations, and they're going to want to move things around. Of course, right? And game design is this fluid process. So this is a flexible system to support that. So let's go back to the walls tile map and make a few changes. I've decided I want a slightly higher, I want a slightly higher ceiling here. So I'm going to come in here and start changing that. And we can see the tile map collider just adapts. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Good. OK. So now let's, uh, I think we're going to put a player in this scene. Let's grab a player. OK, let's see a scene with a player in it. And I'm going to hit play on this. Keep in mind, this player is, again, just a game object, nothing special. Of course, some scripts to help her run around. And I'm going to hit play. And now we're just running around in the scene. And as we can see, the colliders are working just fine. Great. OK, now let's take a look at a larger level. Let's open up the uh, main town. This is the main town from, um, from Phased. I'm going to hit play on this. Now, it's a really interesting level, and I'd like to explore it a bit more. But um, I'll probably need a follow cam to help me get around, right? So I can see what I'm doing. Let's make some cameras. OK. <laughs> so with Cinema Machine 2D, you install Cinema Machine off the Asset Store. It shows up right here. We've got a new camera. It's a new class of camera. It's called 2D. Bam, you throw it in your project. OK, so we'd like to follow the player. So let's drag the player and throw it into follow. Great. Now we're following the player. So you might have noticed from the previous demo these guides, the compositional guides. So they work the same way here, too. So you can say where you'd like to compose the player. Now, let's go into play mode and tune some cameras. Hang on a sec, Adam. You're in play mode, and you're going to tune settings. You're going to change things in play mode. Yeah, because as so many of you know, when you're tuning cameras, you need to be in the game to tune them. Like, I need to see what's going to happen when I run up here. Let's zoom in a little bit more. It's too small. And what happens when we go up these steps? You want to tune and create this stuff on the fly, because you need to see it in context. So we've got this little button right here. See this? Save during play. So all the camera work that you do, you save in play mode. So if we want to change this guide a little bit, if we want to zoom in, this becomes our gameplay camera. You can see we've got a little bit of lag. I can actually turn that down. OK, so that's OK. We've got this one base camera. Now, it's really nice to have the cameras reinforce gameplay. So what's something that happens in this game? What, what do we come up to that we can do okay. a camera yep. something with? If you go to the left, there's a stack of TVs, if you just keep walking. Okay. And um, what I've done there is I've set up a point of interest camera, because yeah. a, di a dialog box shows up. It tells you a little bit about your, your mission. So is it up here? Here it is. OK, there? Yeah. <laughs> OK. Up. So when you get the stack of TVs, we're going to zoom in on the uh, point of interest with the camera. OK. So what happens here? is we go into this point of interest, and we just turn on another camera. The composition's not that great. Like, look, we're cutting the text off. Yeah, we want to, oh, OK, that's much better. So let's fix that. And blending between different camera properties is as easy as just turning cameras on in your scene. And you can define how they blend to each other and how they blend back. And you can populate your 2D worlds with multiple different camera behaviors to, to reinforce gameplay of whatever's happening in the level. So there we go. That quickly. That's really cool. So, and this never ceases to amaze me, but like, look how small little differences in gameplay cameras can really reinforce and really make the experience better. I mean, in a way, it's all about the details, right, Adam? Absolutely. Yeah. You know, I'm really excited about tile map. Artists and designers are going to be using these custom tiles and brushes to create amazing things. 
to paint and express themselves right in Unity. Yeah, absolutely. And with Cinema Machine 2D, you can spend your time creating cameras and not writing code. With 2017.2, Unity has a great end-to-end -end solution for 2D games. Thank, Thank you, guys. You. Thank you. Thanks, Ross. Thanks, Adam. Love me some 2D. Uh, Cuphead just came out. Who's played Cuphead? Looks great. I love Cuphead. And uh, Pinstripe I like, too. Pinstripe was a fun game. Try that if you haven't. OK, let's context switch. It's been an incredible year uh, for innovation across virtual reality and augmented reality and mixed reality. We've seen an astounding level of creativity and immersive storytelling in these new mediums with everyone trying to pioneer uh, the next thing. Um, we're going to continue to power AR and VR growth with 2017.2. It's stacked with features, including several specific AR enhancements that I'd like to bring two people up to tell you about right now. Please welcome Sarah and Brad. Ever since I was a little girl, I've been passionate about art and creation. And as I grew older, that passion grew into a love for technology. And I ended up getting a degree in engineering. But there's always been that one consistent love for taking what's in my head and bringing it out in front of me, whether that be on a canvas or on a screen. I used to be a grain farmer in Northern Canada. And early on, I learned how important new technologies were to be successful. At that point, I was already thinking about how data overlays and computer vision could have such a massive impact on what we were doing, not only in farming, but in everything. And that's really when I got the bug for augmented reality. I think that there's so many possibilities of this technology from using it to uh, design your future home and envision that, or bring your favorite characters to life and put them on your coffee table. But I also think there's so many scenarios that we don't even know about yet, and things that can come of this that we, we can't even begin to imagine. At Unity, we're, we're on the forefront of this technology, but, but we really need all of you to help us realize its full potential and, and realize how this technology is going to integrate with our lives. The challenges that creators are facing with augmented reality today are unlike the challenges that creators have faced with any new technology before. And honestly, it's really cool that we get to solve these problems together. Please welcome Sarah Stumbo and Brad Wires. As you probably know, Unity powers all the major platforms for VR and AR. With Unity 2017.2, we support a few new platforms, Microsoft Windows Mixed Reality headsets and OpenVR for Mac OS, as well as Vuforia. Vuforia is a native built-in platform that allows experiences where you can interact with everyday objects. We already have a robust set of features and integrations for XR. Just look at all of the tools that are available right now for you to start innovating. Tonight, we're just going to take a little bit of time to demonstrate some of the latest enhancements. Unity now supports Google's AR Core and Apple's AR Kit. We've seen thousands of developers, pioneers, explorers jump on and help solve some of the hardest design and technical problems. Now we want to demonstrate and show you a few of these features. All right, so I was browsing the Asset Store, and I found this drone. And I thought it would be really fun if we could take that drone into AR and fly it around. So I actually have an AR app running on my device right now. Uh, before I put the drone in, I just want to go over the three key features for Unity Mobile AR development. And that's plane finding, motion tracking, and light estimation. So we can see plane finding in action here. These blue lines represent the plane that my app has found. So when my app is running, it's searching for planes and feature point. And that's just a representation of that plane. So when I tap here, my object will appear. And what I just did is I shot a little ray cast out of the camera and detected to see if it collided on that AR plane there. So uh, now my drone is there. I added a little timeline onto it to just make it animate slowly down. Oh, 
There we go. Uh, I'm gonna have to start it over because I just lost tracking there. One second. <laughs> <laughs> nice one, Sarah. Yeah, I know. All right, and it's back. It only took a couple seconds. All right, so now that my object is there and I still have the app running successfully, I'm able to move around it. And this is because of motion tracking. So my device's camera is actually matched to the Unity camera in the scene. Now, the drone looks pretty good, but it could look even better using light estimation. Ooh, there it goes. So if I turn light estimation on with this button here, what that does is it takes the lighting from the environment and it maps it to my object so it makes it look more real. And if I move my drone over there, then it gets darker. Now, it's important that if you're building an AR game, you want to test changes as frequently as possible, but you don't want to have to build to the device every time. And a great way to do this is with Unity's AR remote feature. So let's take a look at that on my Mac here. So right now, it's just a big green screen. And when I hit Start, it's going to start this remote AR session. And it's going to pull these real world elements into the editor so that I can actually test my changes without having to push them to my device every time. And just like that, my plane appears. And I can pop my drone down there. So this will save you a ton of time if you're building AR projects. Now that Sarah's shown us the basics, let's have a look at this in the editor. So the first thing you can see here is that I've added a track pose driver component to the camera. This enables motion tracking, like Sarah brought up earlier. This component is cross-platform, and you can even use it for VR. So I can set up a VR controller with this object, with this component, and it'll match the object in the scene. Another feature here that you can't see because we handle it for you is our AR background renderer. This is what allows CG content to render on top of the real world. It's built in and optimized for performance, which means you'll have more room to build immersive content. Now, since both of these features are cross-platform, this will allow you to target more devices and reach a wider audience. Yeah, because there's going to be like new AR devices coming all the time. So, um, Another thing I want to point out is uh, the drone model that we used. We got pretty lucky because it actually matches up to the scale of the real world or the augmented reality world. But let's say I want to replace it with something bigger, like a rocket ship or maybe a blimp or taking a whole environment and putting it onto a table. I don't want my objects to appear at full scale. They would just be way too big, and you probably wouldn't be able to see them because your camera would just be inside of the object. Um, and artists, when they author their assets, they're authoring them at full scale most of the time. So to solve this, Unity has developed a scaled content solution for AR. That means you don't have to reauthor or manually scale all your assets, particles, lighting, physics, or even gameplay mechanics like shooting distance or walking speed. We take care of this for you, which basically means that there are thousands of assets out there that are AR ready right now. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, so I've taken uh, the app that I started with just the drone, and I've added a bit more functionality to it to make it more interactive. So um, let's pull up my device. Let's not pull that up. <laughs> I think. Is that your personal phone? Yeah. <laughs> there we go. That's what I like to see. Shameless plug, yeah. <laughs> All right, so I'm running this on my Android now, which means I'm using the Google AR Core SDK. And it's going to work really similar. So you can see that it already has detected this plane here. It's just represented with this um, blue mesh instead of the blue lines. So I can tap on that mesh, and my drone appears. Uh, now I just have a few controls, so I can actually fly my drone around. Whee! Forward and back. And it's cool because it just looks like it's actually flying around in space. Now, just because I'm flying it around this space doesn't mean that my app isn't still thinking about the planes and the feature points. Actually, I can just drop something on the ground right now. And we can see up there that we have a little message for you all. Welcome to Unite. And you all look great. <laughs> So this is just one simple example of how you can leverage Unity for mobile AR development. 
The last thing I want to leave you with is this. All of the features and workflows that you need and love in Unity apply to AR development, which means any AR creator can take advantage of this. If you are a Unity developer, you are an AR developer. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Brad. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Brad. So, look, let me just double-click on that idea a bit. You, you, Unity developers are now AR developers, if you choose. With the tools that Brad and Sarah just talked about, you have everything at your fingertips to take a run at um, what will be close to a billion mobile devices that will be AR ready over the coming 18 months. So somewhere out there is definitely the defining games on AR ready to be made using these tools. And if you need more education, we've got you covered. We've got you covered with you know, over 12, I think, XR sessions over the next two days for you to be educated at beginner and advanced levels so you can really make the most of these tools. So. Context switching. I'm going to move over here. I'm still the same person, but I'm going to move over here to talk about something else. <laughs> it's still me. So, you, look, we've been, talking, we've been talking about gaming, and why shouldn't we be talking about gaming? It's what we love, it's what we do, and it's what Unity was created to do. Unity's been forged in gaming, but something really exciting has been happening. The work that you've been doing as a developer community in making games over the last decade has had other developers and artists in other industries look at that real-time interactivity and start to think, huh, how could I use Unity to make my product better? So we're starting to see Unity getting used by the automotive industry, by the creative agency uh, industry to make new ways for interactive advertising by the architecture industry to realize real-time architecture decisions quicker. And we want to go deep on one of those industries today, which is film and cinematic storytelling. And we want to go deep using a partnership that we've been working on for the last six months that we're really excited about. Now, to tell you about that is someone called Isabel Riva. Isabel is our head of Made With Unity. She's made this partnership happen. And Isabel is a really storied uh, producer. She's worked in games. She's worked in movies, she's worked in visual effects. She understands the creator's heart and soul, and she understands the creative process. So here to talk to you more about Unity and cinematic storytelling is Isabel Riva. Please welcome Isabel Riva. Tonight is a treat. You're going to meet a talented storyteller who's here to share with you his first ever creation in Unity. Yes, he's a Oscar-nominated director, but he started out as a 3D artist in the 90s in Vancouver, working on Stargate SG-1 and Dark Angel. He did, though, what many of you do, is he broke out as an indie and started making films on the side. And what resulted was Tetraval, a short faux ad about a robot police force in the third world. Alive in Joburg, a gritty documentary about aliens marooned in Johannesburg. Now, these films got him noticed because he had this novel way of blending lo-fi production value in documentary cameras with seamless CGI. So, this signature style is what was cemented when he made his first feature film, which just happened to be produced by Peter Jackson. So District 9 was celebrated that year. Yes, please. Amazing film, amazing. And not only was it celebrated for its technical achievement, but it was celebrated because it blended social commentary with science fiction. And this is what's amazing about Neil Blomkamp. Wired Magazine said, Neil Blomkamp specializes in science fiction that makes us think about what it means to be human. And I think he's done it again. Please welcome Neil Blomkamp. <laughs> Thank 
No hug? Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Susan. Thanks. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Yeah. Um, I just want to start by saying we're so excited that you've expanded the universe of Adam and right. that Never in our wildest dreams we could have imagined it would turn out so beautifully. Thank you. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what it, it, what it was like for you and your team to see the original demo from 2016? Yeah, sure. So what happened was, um, you know, we have this experimental kind of film studio in Vancouver, which is this, this miniature machine that's designed to do creative work and just be sort of off the grid and experiment on stuff. And one of the main things that we wanted to be doing was cinema in real time. Like, we started thinking about that. And uh, while we were sort of like, how do, you know, which pieces should we do in real time? How do we go about starting to implement a pipeline like that? This piece came out that Unity had done mm -hmm. that featured, first of all, a really interesting science fiction setup and uh, the execution was, was super interesting. You know, rendered, rendered like at over 30 FPS, looking uh, amazing. So it got passed around the office, and um, uh, a, bunch of, a bunch of people even outside of the office sent it to me, and they were like, have you seen this? And you know, so it was a big deal. Like, we all really, really, really enjoyed it, and we, we also realized that it spoke to something that we wanted to move towards. Right. So we were very aware of it. Now, the Oats team, I want you to talk to me a little bit about the studio. Mm -hmm. Many of them are here in the audience tonight, right? Yeah, there's, yeah they're there. Yeah, how many? Uh, I don't know, I think there's like 14 of them. Yeah, they're, they're, I see Ted's laugh. Ted's laugh is tall. <laughs> That's great. So, so tell me about Oats and, and the mission and what you guys do there. So, I mean, basically, um, we don't really know. <laughs> we're not really sure what we do there. We, we, basically, we're trying to, I guess what our end goal is, is to figure out how to make films directly for the audience, right? So if we can figure out an economic system to make the piece and the audience pays for it, and we kind of get to experiment and they, they understand what they're buying into, that's where we want to go. So we built um, uh, an infrastructure that has a very scaled down version of an entire studio, from production to costume design to you know production design, visual effects, and uh, we really just want to make creative stuff. Right. So that's the, the first thing is like just making little vignettes and pieces and kind of seeing how people respond to them and then seeing what we can uh, evolve and grow and make bigger. Right. And one of the experiments in this great incubator of mm -hmm. stories and ideas and techniques was the sequels to Adam. Correct. Um, are you ready? Do you, would you like to share with the audience? I am. I would, I would love to show this to the audience because uh, this audience understands what real time is, which is really, you know, really cool. And I think, hopefully, it feels like something that is, uh, is impressive to be running at 30 FPS on a computer that, you know, is basically like a high-end gaming computer. It's pretty amazing. These monitors um, have a little bit, like, there's, there's, you'll see some gamma banding in them. It's not 100% perfect, because obviously they're giant stadium monitors. But if you ignore a little bit of the artifacting, just focus on, uh, you know, what we attempted to pull off, and I think we're pretty proud of. Great. Yeah. Let's show the film. You want to know what you are?
used to live in the walled city of the Consortium. You were cut away from your bodies. You can't remember because the Consortium wiped your mind. One felony conviction saves the lives of ten citizens. Only your brain is of no use to the Consortium. As your brain is tainted. We don't know why they keep us alive. To what end? But it has been this way for generations. I had to unlock you. Otherwise you would have wandered aimlessly. Till your batteries failed and your brains suffocated. I chose life for you. I will always choose life. But for those of you ensnared in the illusions of the past, the mirror can tell you who you once were. The mirror? What's that? What is the mirror? The mirror reads the traces of your mind. She knows your histories. Your crimes. Consortium Criminal Code, Article 1-1A, Felony, Treason, Article 1-1B, Felony, Terrorism, Crimes Against the Consortium, A Terrorist Attack at the Tacoma Walled City, A Political Dissident, I've seen this film a few times now, and it still takes my breath away. Um, and this is one of two short films that Neil's made with this story. So the other one comes out in about a month, but this is the first of those two episodes. Um, can you, I'm sure everybody's curious, how would you say you approached the realism in this film? Because it's, it's quite impressive. Can you say a bit more about yeah. that process? Um, the, you know, this, this one, uh, which is the first of the two, um, some, of the, some of the ideas behind uh, what we wanted to do was try to implement a little bit more, like the most filmic approach that we could, that we could think of. So, I, we don't, I, you know, we're not game makers, we didn't really know what the best way was to go about making, making the assets on a, on a game basis, but we knew how, I think we would do it in visual effects. Mm -hmm. And um, so one example is in the film that's coming up, uh, we wanted to, try to create the environment that the actors were inside of to, to, to basically just look as real as we could possibly get it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we used photogrammetry to do that, and we gathered you know, 30,000 photos around um, an abandoned mine in California that we rebuilt as a 3D mesh. Um, and that data came in, like not just three-dimensionally, but also with RGB data, so you kind of have these, you know, your textures are, are sort of built into the model. Mm. And so th that looks incredibly real. And then when you, when you drop that into, into a real-time engine and you walk around inside of it, it, it's, it looks surprisingly convincing, you know? Mm. It's that sort of approach. So then we also made, um, we made costumes for real. Um, and we physically could look at them and hold them. And, you know, obviously we could photograph them and use them for textures. But we could also film them for reference for cloth simulation and then try to match our cloth simulation to the simulation of, you know, of real life. So there, were a lot of, there was a lot of that kind of thing. But in, the fir in this first film, it's actually a lot of those techniques were implemented in the second film. Wow. So real costumes, real sets, real yeah. actors? Yeah. I mean, I'm not... <laughs> is there such a thing as a not real actor? <laughs> no, no, I mean... Yeah, but, yeah real actors. Yeah. We, do, we do have to use actors to drive the performance. <laughs> right. But can you say more about the, the motion capture and the facial capture performance? Yeah. So we had... Um, we had an interesting approach to facial capture that I, I don't know how 
sort of, you know, uh, how much it's used in games. Um, in, in, in film, it may have been done as, as one of the ways that facial capture is, is gathered, but what we wanted to do was we didn't want to do blend shapes and morph targets. So we wanted to gather, uh, you know, a, a, basically a streaming set of individual frames that were captured. So 30 FPS of um, high fidelity facial capture that basically plays back like a flip book. So there isn't, there isn't any um, animation or deforming that's happening to the face. It's just a collection of the closest representation of the actor that we could get, that we could get to work in Unity. And why did you do that instead of traditional morph targets and facial rigs? Um, well, it, nothing needed to be procedural. There was, no, there was no need for it to be procedural. And um, there was also, you know, it, it basically I thought it would give us the highest uh, fidelity in terms of, of muscles beneath the skin and uh, the way the eyes move, you know, uh, wrinkles, stuff like that. And that, sorry, my microphone. We see that a lot in the second film in the one that's coming where you've got yeah. some CG humans. Yeah, we have two CG humans in the next piece. Okay. And, and I mean, all of that, you know, uh, learning or, or R&D for us is really, is really all about um, where we want to... Oats, Oats has a bunch of, of, of shorts that we want to make where the way that I think we think of real time is, is this very efficient economic way of returning to something. So you take the hit for building all of the assets and building the environments. And once they're built, they just exist forever. And we have our own mocap stage, so we can bring the actors back to populate these environments, and it becomes like episodes of, of Seinfeld or, you know, of Cheers. You revisit, the, you you, revisit the set. Exactly, you revisit it, and it just becomes, it becomes very efficient as time goes on. So there's a, there's a really amazing comic artist who's one of my favorite artists in the world called Jeff Darrow. Mm -hmm. um, I love Jeff Darrow, and, and Oates, purchased some of Je uh, Jeff Darrow's illustrations to actually make a recurring, uh, you know, s uh, episodic show, I suppose, out of. And that's a perfect example of how we want to use real time. So a lot of the approaches and the way that we went about doing things was like, how does this help w us being able to produce content, you know, more efficiently, cheaper, and, and to kind of like build it and grow it over time? Right. So, and... Um in terms of Oats and the kind of um, short films that you're making and, and stuff there, do you find that it was, um, it was a good workflow to work in real time? And would you do another film in Unity? Yeah, totally. I think, I think that we'll probably do um, a bunch of stuff. I mean, also, it's also great for experimenting, too. Um, and in terms of final product, it's also awesome. You know? So we're, we're, I mean, we're still finding our feet as a company as it is. But I think there's no question that there's more of this kind of thing that we want to want to make on a creative level, on an efficiency level. What's the biggest? What's the the, the most significant difference between this workflow in Unity making Adam and the the more traditional visual effects workflow that you've used in your other films? Just time. I mean, it's just quicker, you know, and a lot of. Um, a lot of the, the sort of like the lighting artists um, like Avi and, and Youngbin at Oats that are familiar with the traditional way of doing things, mm -hmm. I think found it quite amazing to start moving lights around in real time and just have the environment sort of paint itself in front of your own eyes. So you don't, you know, either waiting for renders that are happening um, over several minutes or overnight if you want to see the whole, the whole sequence. Uh, you so know. It, it would take hours for renders the traditional way, and the new way is happening in, in more of an instant. Yeah, it's 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 an instant situation that the artists work in, um, and I think uh, I was really curious, you know, when we we were talking about um, the idea of doing Adam, and it was like I, I I genuinely wanted to know from the artists, like, is it, are you guys interested in, in going down this road of working real time. And all of them were very, very interested in it. And then over time, we kind of, I spoke to Chris, who's a supervisor, and it was like, he, he was like, no, dude, people really like working on this. Right, I remember I spoke with Chris too. He was saying that some of the artists felt guilty working. Yeah, like they cheated. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because it was just, yeah. it was like, what? Oh, Some of I them have do eight cheat, more though, hours anyway. Of work to do, but it's rendering so fast. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're a sketchy crew. Like, they are. It's a, <laughs> that's a separate thing. Yeah. Yeah. Some of them are incredibly shady. <laughs> <laughs> but would you say then, no, I mean, seriously, the, the second film is almost done. I'm so excited, and I can't wait to share that one. 
But um, would you say overall it was a positive experience and that, you know, would you recommend this to the new generation? Yeah, I think, I think where it's going to get adopted is by the new, the, the, the up and coming generation. Like the version of, you know, in cinema, it would be the directors. Like when I, when I was 18, you know, the technology I could get my hands on. I mean, this is exactly what I would want to get my hands on. And because, you know, this film is live, essentially, it never, it never stops living, meaning some, someone could grab the scene file and put the cameras wherever they wanted to. They could move, they could change the light of, you know, time of day, they could change the wardrobe. Because of that, I think that there's going to be um, advances in sort of narrative storytelling where some kid in some basement is ripping it apart and putting it back together in a way that it, only time will show what that is. Um, but I, the, the merging of three-dimensional uh, interactive experiences and then narrative, like the stuff that I do, like narrative two-dimensional uh, passive experiences, mm -hmm. that sort of merging, I think, is going to happen from a younger generation playing in, this, in software like this. Amazing. Thank you very much, Neil. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. What happened with your mic? Just rubbing. Thank you. Thanks, Neil. Thanks, man. Thank you. Bye bye. Um, okay. Wow. That's a bit special. Chairs off. So, uh, everything that you've seen up to this point is Unity 2017.2 and the Unity 2017 product. That was made in Unity 2017 out of the box. Um, and to recap some of the things you've seen today, you've seen Tile Map, the 2D tool set, you've seen the Cinemachine in 2D, and you've seen cross-platform AR tools for AR Core, AR Kit, and uh, we also work with Euphoria too. They're great too. Um, now, I talked to you at the top of the show about performance, and I said that we are working on some new performance tools that are going to take Unity to the next level of performance so you can achieve the next level of creativity. And I'm really excited to announce our next speaker who's here to show you those performance tools. He's the co-founder of the company. It's Joachim Ante. When we started Unity, our focus was very much on building a game engine that is simple and easy to use. By doing that, we enabled more developers to create games. And we really achieved our goal. Now, over the last couple of years, my focus has really been on how to bring Unity to the next level of performance. When your game has great performance by default, you can use that to create richer worlds more units simulated, more complex simulations, or simply run on more hardware. Please welcome Joachim Ante. Thank you. So we've been working hard on giving you a new way to create game code in C Sharp with great performance by default. So to show that, we have a demo that was created by our friends at Nordios. Nordios is an independent game developer from Belgrade, Serbia. And they created one of the most successful mobile sports games called Top 11. They also have a new MOBA coming out soon for iOS and Android called Spell Souls Duel of Legends. And they were really eager to find out how to use our new tech to power future games. So they built a tech demo showcasing massive scale simulation using the artwork from one of their mobile games. Let's take a look.
<laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> that is pretty amazing. So Nordios, they took the assets from their mobile game and an early build of the C-sharp job system and component system. And they built the simulation code for this from scratch in just five weeks. So what you can see here is uh, 40,000 minions. And they're walking around doing all these things. And this is basically the simulation running at more than 60 frames per second. And we're running, every frame, we're running the full simulation. We're doing rendering, and we're doing animation of all those 40,000 units. So there's a lot of stuff happening here. Let's take a look. So we can zoom in on the units all the way down here. And um, also, we can cast these spells. So let's, let's check that out. Let's find a nice angle here. All right, and then let's just hit it. And there's a couple of really cool effects here. I also really like this, um, this angel that comes flying in here like that. <laughs> All right, cool. Um, <laughs> so the main thing is, when I was blowing up all those units, you can see the frame rate is still running at a rock solid 60 frames per second. And all these units, they're actually individually animated units. So what's happening here, if we look at this, you can see, basically, there's a C-sharp job which figures out which animation each of these units should play and at what time it is. And then there's a vertex shader which basically does the animation sampling and, um, and the skinning so that we can just render a massive amount of these units. And the minions, they are also walking in these formations. So for the C-sharp job system, we have some APIs. Like, for example, we have a new low-level NuffMesh API. And with that NuffMesh API, you can, from a job, do pathfinding. So each formation performs pathfinding to figure out where they should go next. And then each minion inside of that formation it uses the enough mesh to basically stay on it. So every single, every single agent, every frame, it moves along the enough mesh to stay on it. And one thing I can also do is I can spawn some more units, because clearly 35,000 units is not enough, right? So, all right, so now we have 44, and that's clearly not enough, so we put some more and some more, and some more, and some more, and then some more. And now we have 100,000 units. <laughs> All right. And of course, you know, we can zoom in here, and that's, I mean, it's, let's say it's a little dense. <laughs> but it's running, it's still running over 30 frames per second, and of course, I can just blow all this stuff up here like that. And we're not really, we're not really uh, losing much frame rate when we do that. I mean, we're instantiating, destroying objects, doing all these things, and just the frame rate just stays rock solid. So. We have three pieces of technology that really come together here in this demo. So um, the first one I want to show you is um, the timeline profiler. Or, I mean, uh, sorry, I want to show you the C-sharp job system. And we're going to look at it in the timeline, in the profiler. So here we see all these jobs running. So I'm just going to pick one of those. Yeah, let's, let's take that. All right, so let me zoom. Oh, sorry about that. Um, 
Let me zoom in on, it, on that a bit. So, so what we can see here is that first, first of all, all of the game code is running on jobs. There's very little actually running on the main thread. So what you can see here, we have some code that runs the NuffMesh queries for the formations. Um, we have the code which basically deals with figuring out what animation to play on each of these units. Then over here, we have the jobs which are responsible for making sure that these minions avoid each other and don't run into each other. Um, they're moving around in, the, in these jobs here. Um, and then we even have jobs here doing, uh, doing raycasts. So we can schedule jobs that basically in batch do a bunch of raycasts and running multi-core, and that gives some really significant speed ups. So essentially, all the game code is written in, uh, in C Sharp jobs. And there's very little work happening on the main thread. And we're getting, um, we're getting 96% multi-core utilization on this 10-core PC. All right. So this demo also uses our new entity component system. And the primary goal of it is performance. We're making it so that instantiating, adding, removing components at massive scale becomes feasible. In this demo, when we shoot arrows, we instantiate thousands of entities in the same frame, and there's just no noticeable impact on performance. And most importantly, the component system, it manages all the memory for you of all these components. And so CPUs, they get the best performance when all the memory is accessed completely linearly. So the data for the components, it's tightly packed. And the system for the minion game logic, when it runs, we're actually iterating over each of these, uh, these components, the minion data, completely linearly in memory. And that gives some really significant performance boosts. And so the default approach to writing game logic in this new system is also the most efficient. And the new component system is also built with c -sharp jobs in mind. So it lets you easily write modular component systems, and it makes, makes writing the multi-threaded game code really, really simple. And lastly, we're working on a compiler technology, and that's specifically for these C-sharp jobs. This compiler is quite different from normal compilers in that it really understands math and geometry on a deep level. And it can perform optimizations, math optimizations, that other compilers just don't do. CPUs, they can perform single instructions on multiple pieces of data in parallel. And as a result, they can make the code run faster. And this is complex to do by hand, usually. So our compiler automatically vectorizes your code, your C-sharp code, and it generates these vectorized instructions specifically for your target platform. So here is some of the results that we got from this new compiler technology. So these are four different jobs that we have uh, running in our in our demo. And compared to Mono, we get something between 5 to 13x speed ups. And that's. <laughs> yeah. that, that's pretty good, right? Um, and, and that really means that code, once you write your code in this C -sharp job system, then you can use either the new compiler or Mono. But usually, you'll probably want to use the faster option. And you just, <laughs> you just, you just, you just put an attribute on your C-sharp job, and then it runs faster. Um, and you know, performance, you can use it for a lot of things. You know, just because you have better performance, you could also use it to reduce battery consumption, for example, because this compiler actually makes your code run more efficient. 
So C Sharp Jobs, new component system and new compiler technology. And combined, I think these features, they will dramatically change what you can achieve with Unity. I did it. Hey. Hi. Hey. Um, so here's the key question. When is all of this available for right. these great people? So that's the best part. So the C Sharp job system will ship in uh, Unity 18.1. Um, and that includes basically the C Sharp job system itself, safe scheduling of jobs, and a new container library that makes it really easy and really efficient to write uh, multi-threaded code. Also, we will have a preview, an early preview of the new entity component system, and we're going to ship that with full source code in C Sharp. Yeah. <laughs> And then later in 2018, we will ship the C Sharp compiler technology. And that's when it ships, you just enable an attribute and your code runs faster. That's great. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's not theory, it's incoming. It's real. It's real. That's and great, it's man. beautiful. Are you, uh, you going to stick around and close this thing yeah. with me? Yeah, let's do that. Thanks. It's lonely up here. I need your help. <laughs> well, you know, at the beginning, I said to everyone that we're here to celebrate their creativity, right? That's why we hold these things. Mm -hmm. And nothing um, celebrates creativity like our Unity Awards. And uh, we've got the Unity Awards 2017. Yeah. And these represent the best from you and your peers across 13 categories, these 13 categories, in fact. And here are the, uh, we had fierce competition. Here are the finalists across all 13 categories. These people are finalists in the Unity Awards 2017, so I think that's worth a round of applause. These names are up here. <laughs> Congratulations. Congratulations for being finalists in one of these categories. Do you know the winner of I all do. of these? I very much do. You do? Yeah. <laughs> Co-founder. Um, uh, should, we, should we tell, should, yeah. we, should we let everyone let's, else in on that? Let's do that. Should we do that? That'd be a nice thing to, to finish with, is just to celebrate the winners. Yes. And uh, should we do it kind of on three? Yes. And then see if the magic of PowerPoint works? Let's yeah? do it. You, what, we're going to go one, two, th ready? One, one, two, three. There's the winners. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Um, con congratulations to all of these winners in these 13 categories. Now, this is a very big deal. We know making things is hard, but making games and experiences that can be critically acclaimed by your peers takes really special dedication. It takes a special grit. So if your name is up here, we know what you went through to make something that delights and innovates. So congratulations again. <laughs> but let's, uh, let's take a, a look at the winner's work. Let's run that video.
Before we say goodbye, we want to tell you about an exciting new show that's making its debut this week. It's called Unite Austin Live, and we'll be streaming live from the Expo Hall right here. We've got some really great guests lined up. They'll be making several announcements exclusively on the show. So if you're at the show, please stop in. It's going to be at the Expo. If you're not here and you're watching at home, just tune into the live stream that's on our YouTube and our Facebook sites. Okay. This evening, we've seen some really, really great demos from members of Unity. I'd like to invite them back on stage so we can just say thank you to them, give them a round of applause. Sp speakers, please come back. So, um, look, have a great couple of days, be inspired, have fun, and the fun starts now because we have a reception right back here. Come and join us for a drink and let's get this thing started. Thank you. Here we go. Nice one, man. Nice one, man. Well, uh...